So hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Lise Brain and I am a uh, program officer with CARL, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. And so thank you for joining us today. And in just a moment, I will introduce our presenter for today's webinar. But first, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous land on which I'm located. Uh, I live and work on the East Coast in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which was first signed in 1726. Uh, I'd like to urge you all to engage with recognizing and upholding our treaties, which play a central part in achieving reconciliation and upholding Indigenous rights. So a quick, a few quick notes, and then I'll hand over to, uh, to Monica. Um, first, just a quick note that we are recording this session and we'll be posting the recording to the Carl YouTube account. Uh, that will be closed captioned uh, for this webinar, so that will also be available. Uh, Monica will be happy to answer questions at the end of this presentation, so you can enter those into the Q&A function and we'll get to those at the end of her session. Uh, Monica will also be making her slides available to us, so we'll be posting those to the CARL website uh, for anyone who'd like to access those after the fact, so no need to write down everything she says <laughs> or has on screen. J'aimerais juste dire rapidement à tous les francophones, vous souhaitez la bienvenue et uh, vous laissez savoir qu'on accepte bien sûr les commentaires et les questions en français et je peux en assurer la traduction pour Monica. I was just saying, Monica and others, that uh, we can accommodate comments and questions in French that I'll be happy to translate, translate those into English. And then uh, last little order of business is that Carl has a code of conduct for all our events and working groups and conferences. Uh, and we expect that you should all be aware of them, uh, aware of it and abide by it so that uh, we can make this a welcoming and inclusive space for everyone. I'll post the link to the code of conduct in both French and English in the, into the chat in just a second. So now I'd like to introduce to all of you Monica Weston. Uh, Monica met with the Carl Open Repositories Working Group a few months ago, and we really felt that everything she had to say about the inner workings of Google Scholar uh, was really, really interesting and very useful to anyone involved in their repositories. So we thought we would invite her to come speak to you um, as a larger group. So Monica leads outreach and partnerships for Google Scholar. She previously managed the University of California's eScholarship repository and library publishing program. She's currently completing her MLIS from San Jose State University, and she volunteers in the metadata group at the Law Library of Congress. So thank you so much for meeting with us, Monica, and over to you. Thank you, Liz, and thank you everyone for joining. It's really, really great to be here. Um, as Lee said, my background is as a repository librarian, and I was just telling her anecdotally before the call that um, when I worked at eScholarship, the University of California repository, I didn't always know everything about Google Scholar, and I felt it was a bit of a black box. So this is really coming full circle for me. Um, so it's, it's a real delight and honor to be here. I am sharing my screen. Um, and again, these slides will all be shared after the talk, particularly because they contain links to things like code patches, but we'll get there. So I'm going to turn my video off so you aren't looking at the side of my face because I'm looking at another uh, monitor. Um, so just to give an overview of this talk, um, the informational portion of this should last about 30 minutes. Um, it'll start with an overview of how the Google Scholar indexing system works, what's needed for inclusion, and how to check your repository's coverage in Scholar and see if it's being well indexed. Um, if your repository isn't being comprehensively or well indexed, I want to make sure you know how to do some troubleshooting for common errors. So from there, in the second part of the talk, I'll describe common repository indexing problems and how to identify them as well as fix them, even if you're not a developer. I'll also share information about where you can find Google Scholar resources and troubleshooting guidelines. Um, and then to finish, uh, I have been in my role at Google Scholar for about two years now. And in this time, I've worked with hundreds of repositories worldwide on indexing issues. 
The longer that I'm here, the more persuaded I am that platform level support is needed for indexing large repositories in any kind of sustainable way. And I wanna end my talk with what I've seen over the last few years working with repositories and how I think all repository platforms can better support the work of librarians like you. Um, finally, there'll be plenty of time, uh, as Lise said, for questions and answer sessions at the end. Um, I also received a few thoughtful questions in advance of the talk, so I'll make sure we get to those. So, um, how the Google indexing system works, uh, Google Scholar. The Google Scholar indexing system works by finding scholarly content, identifying the associated metadata with that content, and grouping different versions of items together in search results. So to do this, first, our crawler scans the entire web for scholarly items. Once an item has been identified, the system analyzes the bibliographic metadata for this item. It then groups all versions of the item together in search results, which you can see in the all four versions here that I've circled in red. Um, so in terms of indexing repositories, uh, obviously Google Scholar is used very extensively by researchers all over the world. And having your repositories collection included in Google Scholar search results creates global visibility for these publications. We know how important this benefit can be to your faculty authors. And it also shows the crucial role of the library in the dissemination of your institution's research outputs. Repository full text publications also provide a crucial piece of full text access for researchers worldwide. You can see that on this slide. So the image here shows a typical Google Scholar search result for an item that's uniquely held by a repository. Both the primary link for this item and what we call the access link on the right which goes straight to the PDF, point to this publication in the DSpace repository. And repository publications provide a crucial piece of access uh, for other types of publications, not just uniquely held publications in the repository. So when a formally published version of an item is available on the publisher's site, that version will usually be listed as the primary link, the title link. The repository version would then appear as the access link if there isn't an open access version on the publisher's site. And you see that here, um, this, this link on the right goes to a repository publication. If this repository is being properly indexed, the repository version will also be in the all X number of versions I mentioned earlier. So on the next slide, I wanna show you what this all four versions page for this item looks like. So this is the page I'm taken to when I clicked all four versions for that previous item uh, from Cambridge University Press. You can see that the first result is the publisher's version. In addition, it includes other versions of the article indexed by Scholar, including this repository. So now that you know how to look in the cluster of different versions for any given item, you can do a coverage check for your entire repository. Um, there's a little bit of misinformation floating out there about how to do a coverage check for Google Scholar. So I want to make sure um, that I emphasize what doesn't work. And that is doing a search like this and using the result count of searching your repository site in Scholar search. Um, so why isn't that accurate? The number of results that you'll see will be inaccurate because these numbers, the result counts, only apply to primary links. And as I just showed you, the repository version of an item is often not the primary link. It's in that X number of versions. So that means the number you see as the result count will likely be much lower than the number of items indexed. So instead, the best way to check for Google Scholar coverage is to choose several randomly selected items across different collections in the repository and search for these titles in Scholar. Be sure to click the all X number of versions link to go to that um, all versions page I showed you and see if there's a link to your repository version. If you find links for all these titles, two versions in the repository, you're in good shape. Um, that's a very strong signal that your repository is being well indexed. If you find that some or all of this content isn't being indexed either in one collection or across multiple collections, I hope that the next part of my presentation will help you get started with troubleshooting. So I'm going to go into common repository issues um, and that will take up uh, maybe about 10 minutes, but I wanna start by going through what is actually needed for indexing before I turn to sort of what can go wrong. 
So what needs to be in place for repository indexing to work well? What does the Google Scholar indexing system need to find your repository's items and include them in the search results as I've just shown? I described earlier how it begins by crawling the web. That means access to crawl your repository site is necessary for items to be found at all. And the system also needs to know when new content is added. This usually means a setup with a browse by date or a sitemap with links to item level URLs. Um, these two setups, uh, sitemaps or browse are usually on by default for most platforms, although there are some exceptions. Um, for example, Islandora repositories don't always have sitemaps included by default. I'll get more into a couple of platform specific issues later. Finally, to identify metadata for the publications it finds, the Scholar system needs to have access to machine readable metadata for these items. Google Scholar uses machine readable metadata elements called meta tags. Um, these take the form of citation underscore. ePrints and BPress use slightly different variants of these meta tags. You may see them referred either as Highwire Press tags or Google Scholar tags as well. The image on the right shows a typical set of meta tags. It's actually taken from our inclusion guidelines, which I'll make sure you have a link to uh, later in this talk and in the slides. Um, the meta tags in the green box contain familiar bibliographic metadata like author names and publication date. The last meta tag in the red box tells the indexing system the location of the file that this metadata belongs to and should be associated with. These meta tags are on by default for almost all repositories. Um, and you can review the meta tags for an item in your repository by going to the landing page for an item, then viewing the HTML source. Usually you can do this by right clicking on the page and selecting view page source. Um, you, or use a keyboard command, kind of depending on which browser you're using. Um, and that, that uh, screenshot is a bit small, but there I've just basically right clicked in Chrome and selected view page source. Once you're on the HTML source page uh, for the landing page, you can search for all instances of citation underscore to see the li list of meta tags, um, which would be embedded into the landing page for that item. This process of looking at the source for landing page URLs for specific items will be used to test and troubleshoot many of the repository indexing errors I'm gonna move on to soon. Um, so how do you review the meta tags for an item? When you're reviewing these meta tags, you always wanna compare them to the metadata and the version of record. For example, the PDF or the publisher's version of the article. Here you see the version of record above the meta tags for the version of this paper in the repository. Um, these meta tags look great, and I'll tell you why. First, the publication dates outlined in red match. So you can see the publication date in the version of record matches this citation date tag, uh, both say 2009. Authors are outlined in green, and notice that um, all authors are included, and also that the order of the author meta tags is the same as the author order in the version of record. I'll explain more about that soon. And also note that because um, the full text, here you can tell this because of the abstract outlined in blue is written in Portuguese, so are the meta tags. Um, and there should be a blue box at the bottom here. Um, but at the very bottom, you should see title meta tag. Um, and the title would also be written in Portuguese. I'll go into more detail about these best practices soon. So I've spent a lot of time talking about bibliographic meta tags early on because this is by far the most common area for repository items when it comes to Google Scholar indexing. Um, indexing in Google Scholar requires accurate meta tags. And incorrect metadata is gonna result in unhappy authors, items not being ranked as they should be due to missing citations. Those are sort of uh, a first order of things that can happen. The indexing system also automatically detects sites with frequent metadata errors and is forced to drop them. Um, so if your repository has been totally dropped from the Google Scholar index, it may be due to frequent metadata errors. There are a couple of other causes for repository indexing errors. Site outages should be avoided, and I recommend sticking with the default crawler access settings for your repository. I'll get back to these at the end of my presentation. But I want to turn now to common indexing errors for repositories, mainly related to metadata. So publication date. The publication date is a crucial piece of metadata for indexing scholarly articles. 
Other dates, like the date a paper was uploaded to the repository, should not be substituted if the publication date is not available. It's better not to include a publication date meta tag at all than to include an incorrect one. If the publication date in the citation date tag or the citation publication date meta tag doesn't match the publication date in the version of record, it's a red flag for the indexing system. Um, and here I've created a typical example. Um, this is most commonly what I see with date errors, which is where the publication date and the repository meta tag is later than the actual date of the item being published. So this suggests that the date the PDF was uploaded to the repository, maybe um, batch uploaded at batch upload date, migration date, or made available online is being listed as a publication date. So to test for this problem across your repository, you would review the HTML code to look at the citation date tag or citation publication date tag um, for a number of items in your repository. And you would compare them with the dates listed in the version of record to see if they're the same. Um, if you're using DSpace um, and the problem is widespread across your repository and does look like that online date is listed as publication date, there's a DSpace patch that's been developed by the community specifically to fix this problem. And without getting too much in the weeds, the GitHub has a lot of information about this. This patch basically ensures that only the publication date is being used and it um, prevents your repository from using sort of backup dates, using other dates in lieu of that date. Um, here and elsewhere, there'll be links to DSpace. I wanna emphasize that the errors that I'm talking about are common for all repositories both proprietary, hosted, and open source repositories, everything in between. DSpace just happens to have, um, it, for some of these known bugs with available code fixes uh, that are usually community created. Author order. Unlike other author meta tags, the order of author meta tags is really crucial because this controls the author order that appears in scholar search results. Um, this allows the indexing system to match your repository version with other versions. Um, it ensures that citations aren't missed. Um, that author order is really crucial. So the author meta tag with the name of the first author for a publication needs to appear in the HTML source before the author meta tag with the name of the second author and so on. Here you see an example where this ordering has gone wrong, which I put together. So not only will the authors and of course our first author be unhappy with the resulting author order in the metadata, um, but if this occurs many times for a repository, the indexing system will be forced to stop indexing it. So to test for author order errors, you would do the same kind of comparison. Um, you would compare the order of author meta tags with the author order in the version of record. And if you find inconsistencies, there are few potential fixes. Um, again, as for incorrect publication dates, this issue is common across all repositories. Um, DSpace just happens to have a known bug with a patch created by the community. Most commonly um, across all repository sites, what I see is authors from the institution being listed first by default, even if they're not the first author. Um, this can happen more often when the repository is also being used as a CRIS. I recommend checking to see if your repository might be doing this. Um, and educate anyone working on the repository about the importance of correct author order in the metadata they enter. There's also a known bug for DSpace version 5.0 through 5.3 um, that has a patch um, that, sorry, the bug creates incorrect author ordering even if they're added correctly. So if you're using one of these versions, you can either apply the DSpace patch to fix the bug or else upgrade to a later version of DSpace. Um, and I think, uh, those working at DuraSpace would want me to recommend upgrading. So not including all the authors for a paper in the author meta tags is another common repository problem. Um, again, I see this across all platforms. And most often this happens when only the authors from the institution are being included. And this is also particularly common for CRIS repository hybrids. If your repository has this error, you would just simply add the missing authors in the meta tags, making sure that they're in the right order. Um, so this is where I get to make a joke about living in California. Um, we also sometimes see the opposite problem of too many authors in meta tags. So here in my very classic uh, California theme dissertation, you see the most common case of listing too many authors in the meta tags. Um, so that's including the advisor for a thesis or dissertation as an author. 
only the author of the thesis or dissertation should be listed as the author in the meta tags. Sometimes meta tags include extraneous trailing information like the name of the repository or the document type. Um, and for whatever reason, this is especially common in title meta tags. So I recommend avoiding adding any elements other than bibliographic information to meta tags. They're not meant to have anything except the information related directly to the bibliographic um, tag itself, like the, the name of the author. So in other words, no honorifics um, or the name of the title, uh, not listing the content type. Um, and you would want to remove any non-bibliographic information from meta tags that you do find. The last common meta tag error is actually, no, there's one more, sorry. <laughs> the last common um, bibliographic meta tag error is combining multiple languages or scripts in the meta tags for a single publication. This results in mixed, often duplicate bibliographic information, and it causes confusion both for the scholar indexing system and for researchers who may, for example, click on a scholar search result that seems to be in an article written in a familiar language and end up on a PDF that they can't read. So the fix for this issue is to use the language of the full text if you have it, or the abstract if you don't, as a guide for the language to use in meta tags for a publication. Don't duplicate this information either within a single meta tag or across multiple meta tags in different scripts. If you have a translated version of the publication as well, the best version is the best practice is to give each version its own separate record in the repository of meta tags in that language. So if, for example, you happen to have a copy of War and Peace in your repository, which would be odd, um, but if you had an English version and a Russian version and a French version, um, full text, you would actually create three separate records with metadata in those three languages. And that ensures that those searching for the text in any of those three languages would end up on the right full text on the right PDF. Oh, and that was the last common metadata error. Um, so there are a few more problems I want to discuss, which um, have to do more with kind of site outages and access. Um, and then I'll return to a, a few specific, like platform specific issues. So repeated site outages can obstruct indexing um, and extended outages can lead the indexing system to believe that your repository is completely inactive. So if your site's been down for extended periods of time, it's possible that the indexing system sort of gave up on it uh, and thought, oh, this site is, is no longer active and it dropped it from the index entirely. So in general, the best advice is to avoid keeping your site down for more than a few hours. Um, to lower the chances the crawler will try to be finding your publications while they're inaccessible. And this kind of goes back to what I said at the very beginning, the crawler is always spidering all over the web looking for scholarly publications. It's not picking up your repository at regular intervals. It's kind of landing on URLs at different times. Um, so if you can minimize the chances that it would land on an on a article it can't access, um, that will help ensure that uh, there's no disruptions. Um, for migrations specifically, a best practice is to keep the old repository functional and live while the new site is being developed um, to avoid interruptions in access for both researchers and the indexing system. When the new site is ready to go live, you would first put article level redirects in place, then change the DNS lookup to the new server. That's the best way to avoid turbulence if your site is migrating. And I just wanna show an example of how an outage affected the Google Scholar coverage of a large vSpace repository. Um, and I wanna just point out that it takes some time for items to be re-added after the site goes back up. So we had the outage around the end of uh, December of 2018, and even by May, uh, the system was only about two thirds back where it was before. So outages are significant and it can take a while for the indexing system to recover. Um, indexing HTTPS sites requires a valid server certificate. An invalid certificate basically effectively blocks the crawler from accessing the site and it forces the indexing system to remove the site from crawling. Um, it's pretty easy to test just open a URL for, for an article from one of your journals in a few different browsers, or sorry, one of your repository publications in a few different browsers, and see whether there are any messages like these about the site not being private. And if so, your certificate provider should be able to resolve the issue. Um, so with that, you've seen what accounts for many common repository indexing errors. Um, here are some others that are slightly less common. 
Um, there are occasionally cases where the crawler is obstructed from finding the items in your repository. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the default setting for crawlers is almost always fine on all the major repository platforms, proprietary and open source. There's almost never a need to adjust it. Um, I would say uh, if you are, I guess I mentioned this before, but be sure to set up redirects if your repository migrates to a new domain or if you renumber items. Um, and then in terms of kind of getting to the full text and making sure that there's full text access, um, two, two points, interstitial forms. So these are like things like registration forms or one-time term of use forms. Um, anything that goes between someone clicking on the full text link and accessing that link, this causes major problems for indexing systems. It's often seen as cloaking. I can describe that more um, in, the, in the question portion if anyone has questions about that, but um, you wanna skip interstitials for users clicking on search results. And finally, cover pages can result in a systematic drop in repository coverage. They often break automated metadata extraction. Um, and sort of the, the short version of this is that the crawler has gotten, or sorry, the parsing part of the indexing system has gotten very good at extracting bibliographic information from PDFs over time, from scholarly PDFs. P adding cover pages pushes that information down the page, makes it harder to find, um, can really affect indexing. One slide about platform-specific errors. These are just two that I've come across um, for these two platforms at this moment. As you know, things are always changing. Um, as I said before, the majority of indexing errors are common across all platforms. But as of the date of this presentation, I did want to highlight a couple of known indexing errors that we've seen that are platform-specific. Um, first, as I mentioned before, island or repositories don't always have sitemaps by default. Um, there's a module that you can use to add a site map to your repository so that your publications can all be found by the indexing system. Um, and we've also recently seen for Digital Commons that for some customized sites, um, some customization seems to remove a slash activity HTML browse by year. Um, this is a browse that helps the indexing system find newly added publications. And it would be best to avoid any customization that would drop this recent additions module with this browse by year uh, link from your homepage. And that is it for, um, for actual indexing errors and fixes. I'm gonna end with a few thoughts about improving platform support for repositories. But before I do, I wanna direct you to a few really useful references and guidelines about Google Scholar. Um, the first one is our own documentation. So if you go to scholar.google.com and click on help on the lower right corner of the page, you'll be taken to our documentation. And um, actually I'll pause for a moment, just as an aside, as librarians, if you get questions about searching Google Scholar, there's also a really nice section about how to search Google Scholar, advanced search uh, tips and tricks. So that's in there as well for your reference. Um, but for repository indexing specifically, the section titled inclusion will provide a comprehensive overview of the indexing process. So I have a direct link there. Um, so it includes the example list of meta tags that I showed you earlier, along with the troubleshooting guidelines I talked about today and a few others as well. Um, so, oh, I didn't put his name here. Uh, Google Scholar co-founder Anuragacharya gave a talk at Open Repositories a few years ago now um, about Google Scholar indexing for repositories. And this one is focused on a range of platforms as well. Um, and his talk gives really helpful context for the best practices that we recommend. So I wanted to make sure you had a link to that as well. So I have just three more slides kind of changing topics a bit um, before we turn to questions. And this is a, this is a newer part of my talk. Um, I have only felt confident really starting to say this, um, you know, to groups and, um, kind of in public as I've been in my role for about two years and I'm really seeing patterns with repository errors. So I said it a few times, but I think it bears repeating. We see repository errors, these common ones that I mentioned today, um, significantly impede and often entirely block the indexing of sites across all platforms. Um, this includes repositories on turnkey proprietary solutions, self-hosted repositories, um, everything in between. And to be completely blunt, I think these kinds of errors are often very challenging to fix at scale from what I've seen. 
I don't mean to negate the first portion of my talk. It's really important as a repository librarian to understand these issues, what's needed to correct them. Um, of course, we care about best practices, but I also understand that you might not always have the resources to do so, especially if you're running a large repository. Um, and in two years of working at Google Scholar um, and communicating with about two, 300 repository administrators all over the world, I've come to believe that the maintenance of correct repository metadata is going to be best done by automated, by automated means for most repository systems. I know firsthand from my work on the University of California's repository that the librarians running IRs are already overworked and wearing too many hats. Um, I don't think that dropping otherly, other scholarly communication work, preservation projects, and anything else that you do should be necessary for your repository to just work. Um, so simply put, managing repositories at scale, meaning most institutional repositories, requires platform level support that I don't think is there yet. So what do I mean by that? What support would be needed for your institutional repository to just work and for me not to need to give webinars like this? Um, I would say there are three approaches, major approaches that um, we've identified. The first one is automatic error detection for new and existing items. So there already exist multiple sources of authoritative publication metadata that offer APIs, um, including Crossref, PubMed, WorldCat. These APIs have the authoritative metadata for the post prints being added to your repositories, and they can be used to identify discrepancies between the version of record and the version of an item you're hosting. Along the same lines, repository software could also compare machine-readable metadata for an item with what's in the PDF itself. So these two approaches would cover many of the existing issues that I spent so much time describing today. And to avoid the creation of future errors, I also think the interfaces where repository items are uploaded could be improved in order to avoid creating these errors in the first place. Even minor changes to the UI can make a big difference. Uh, for example, requiring an explicit publication date for manual uploads and not allowing the upload date to be listed as a fallback date. Many repository workflows, of course, don't include the review of a librarian at all after a student, researcher, or faculty member uploads a publication. So these kinds of checks can offer the kind of quality control for metadata that, that you're not always able to. So, Sort of as I've been in my role for a while and started to have these conversations with our repository platforms, it's something that we've been exploring, but it's not clear that this is necessarily seen yet um, by platforms as something that would be important to help their library repositories. And I think if librarians can join this conversation, their expertise can help advocate for a shift towards supporting really best metadata practices at scale in a sustainable way. Last slide, um, just a couple final thoughts, and then I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussion. So at Google Scholar, um, our motto, and we like to talk about, is standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, your work on your repository directly and immediately helps researchers worldwide to do so every single day. Um, but only when each publication you're hosting can actually find its researcher. Uh, to each researcher, her publication, right? For this to happen in a sustainable, scalable way, it's become clear to me that automation is key, that especially as the sheer amount of research publications continues to grow and library budgets continue to flatten, if not tighten. So truly next-gen repositories that make repository publications as discoverable as possible, as well indexed as possible, can help us get closer to the ideal that no matter where in the world you happen to be from, um, happen to be born in, happen to live, and what subscription access you happen to have or not have through your library, you can stand on and advance the shared frontier of knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. That was fantastic. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> Thank you so much for providing your email address, uh, okay. Monica. And I would love for us to continue this uh, collaboration and uh, discussion in the future. Uh, so on behalf of everybody who's on the call, I really want to thank you. 